So we're going to talk about switch gears just a little bit. We talked about the neck, right, cervical spine, and then the back. We're going to talk about the lumbar spine. Here's the overview. So <clears throat> how many of you have had back issues in the past, like back pain? Well, that's a lot of people for young people. Wow, that's impressive. So eventually, virtually everybody is going to have some form of back pain. It just, and it's because of the fact that we're upright animals, right? So because we're upright, we're not like four-legged animals that are, uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, their spine is sort of a, more of a horizontal position. Ours is more vertical. And so that's why you end up seeing more problems in the back because it, it experiences m more loading as well as more motion. Okay, so that combination of the loading and motion increases the wear of the discs, right? So if you think about it, any type of moving part, um, it doesn't matter if it's on a car, if it doesn't matter if it's on a door, it doesn't matter if it's on your bicycle, any type of moving part is gonna wear down at some point. Nothing lasts forever, right? So, you, this, so the same thing goes even for your own bodies. So if you have a joint that moves, the more it moves and the more loading that it's on, on that joint or on that disc, the faster it's going to degenerate. You know? And it turns out that 80% of the population will experience some sort of like, almost debilitating type of back pain you know, at, at some point in their lives. Almost half of those experience what's called sciatica. Anybody, know, have you heard of that word before, sciatica? Does anybody know what that means? Um, so sciatica, when we talk about that, it means like, like pain that goes down your leg. And typically it goes from your buttock to your hamstring down to your calf, sometimes to your foot, you know? And so um, the good news is uh, the vast majority of those folks, over 90, you know, 95, 96% of those people recover by six months. Um, but, and, and only about, 20% of those require surgery, you know, so the majority of patients that present with these type of symptoms, they don't need surgery typically. So we, we've been talking a lot about this, right? The function of discs, what, what do discs do? They have multiple functions, and you guys said some of these previously. They help to distribute loads. They help absorb energy. It's like a cushion. It helps to maintain alignment, but interestingly, it maintains alignment, but at the same time, it promotes flexibility. So not only is it a stabilizing structure, but it also allows the, the spine to move, the discs do. And finally, it supports stability. So it it's, has these very unique characteristics. And it, it really, there's nothing like the spine in, in the human body. So it really is like, it's, it's like a shock absorber, you know, if you think about it. So it, it helps to sort of deaden the loads that are placed upon the spine. So it allows us, when, when we jump and land, um, it helps to absorb some of that, that energy. Um, so it, it really does, you can kind of think of it as a, as a cushion in between the vertebra. So these are the components of, of a disc. Um, you know, people talk about four different zones, but in reality, you can kind of think of it as the, just the outside. So think of it as the outside is, the, is a tough connective tissue called the the annulus fibrosus, and the inside on the in, inside of the nuclear material is called the nucleus pulposus. So that's really all you really need to, to, to know. And the nucleus pulposus, as the name implies, is the nuclear material. It's more like jelly. So that's outer annulus. And then there's, there's these transition zones that you don't need to really know. And then the nucleus pulposus, those are the two that are really important. The outside, the annulus fibrosus, and the inside, the nucleus pulposus. And so it turns out that, you know, most, most anatomic structures have a vascular supply. So typically the arteries or arterioles go give the blood supply to that, to that end organ. And then the, the veins or venules, they actually take blood away from there, okay? And so it's, it, they bring oxygen typically and other nutrients to that end organ through the artery system, and then, and then it sort of takes the, the, uh, the cells that have less oxygen, the red blood cells with less oxygen, away through the venous system. And typically, there's also a, an innervation. So there's typically a nerve associated with most organs, including the disc. But it turns out the disc, only the, the outer part of that disc is, is innervated. 
So meaning if I took like a needle and I, and I put it just, if I was able to just put it into the nucleus, there'd be no pain, virtually no pain. But if I put it, put a needle right on the, the annulus, it's like, it's like having a cut through the skin. You put a needle into the annulus, you put a needle into that, into the skin and it's going to hurt, right? So patients with even tears, here's a little, little de depiction of a tear over here. If you have a little tear through the annulus, because of these pain fibers, the, the yellow is the nerve, and then this is a tear. Because of it, it has these, it's innervated with these nociceptive fibers, these pain sensory fibers, it hurts. So it's like when you get a tear in, in your disc, you can get a lot of back pain just by virtue of the fact that it's like cutting your skin. So it really, it really is a great analogy of this is the donut, you know? So the outside, the dough would be the annulus and the nuclear material, the jelly would be the nucleus, okay? So just think of that. It's literally is like a donut. Typically, if you had a donut that didn't have this hole there, right? Then, then the disc would be perfectly normal. But what ends up happening is, if you get a if you get a hole in your donut, that's what it hurts. You can get back pain just by virtue of the fact that it has those pain fibers. And then on top of that, if this nuclear the jelly oozes out of the donut, then it's going to hurt because the the it turns out this nuclear material can either push on the nerve and cause pain, and or it also has chemicals within the the disc that really causes an inflammatory reaction to any type of nerves. So that's the dough, which is the an annulus and the jelly, it really is the nucleus. So this is what happens when you get sciatica or leg pain, or it can, in, in the neck, you can get arm pain. We, we call that sort of the term that we use is radiculopathy, like it's ridiculous, but in, in re reality what that means is it's pain in the extremities. And it can occur because you get the jelly that's pressing up against that nerve root and, and also that chemical inflammation. Do um, you guys know what the funny bone is? Okay, so where's the funny bone located? Come on, don't be shy. What'd you, what was that? Where is it? Sure. Which is called the what? Your elbow, yeah, it's in your elbow. So the, you know, when your funny bone's right here on the inside of your elbow, like you can, you can all feel it, right? So on the mid inside of your elbow right here, there's a little groove, right? And then if you feel, there's, there's a nerve there. It's called the ulnar nerve. So this is called the ulnar groove. So that funny bone is when you hit it against a surface and you feel nerve, like shooting pain going down your, your fing small finger especially. That's your ulnar nerve, and they call it a funny bone, but it's, it's really just because when you bang on it, it hurts. So any, any type of mechanical compression and or type of like other type of you know, chemical inflammation can cause pain. So this is what happens. You get, you get pinching, and then you get leg pain. And see this over here? I don't know if you've ever seen a map like this, but this is called a dermatomal map. So it's not like this for everybody, but... In most people, there's a typical pattern that, that you, you find. These nerves, not only do they innervate certain type of muscles, but the sensory map is also very similar. So meaning that um, you know, L4 is typically on the inside of your ankle, L5 is on the top of your foot, and S1 is on the outside of your, of your ankle. Question. Yeah, so um, the zones, typically, it's um, sort of like, you can kind of think of it as like a river, right? So when a river goes to a certain area and then it, and it sort of becomes a lake, right? Because a lake has to come from a river from the mountains, typically, right? So you can kind of think of it that way, where, where the river goes into a lake and that lake is, is a tributary of that, of that river, so the same thing, a nerve goes to a certain area in your body to innervate it both from a motor standpoint where it allows the muscles to move as well as, well as a sensory component where it allows it to feel, okay? And so it would be similar to that where the nerve is innervating a certain area within the body. And, and this is the most common pattern. It's not exactly the same way for every single patient, but I can tell you right now, if a patient comes into my office and they're like, the top of my foot is totally numb. And I'm like, you know what, you have an L5 radiculopathy. 
classically speaking, you know? Remember when I was telling you guys the thumb is C6, the, the middle finger is like C7, and then the small finger is C8? It's similar that way, you know? And in fact, C8 is a higher, up here at, at C8 by your, by your neck or your cervical spine, right? As it comes down here beyond the, and we'll talk about this brachial plexus, there's a plexus of nerves. As it comes out and becomes a peripheral nerve, this nerve, this ulnar nerve originates close to C8 level C. So if you have symptoms in your, in your pinky, it can either be an ulnar, ulnar um, neuropathy or it can be a C8 radiculopathy, okay? So these nerves that have a very, pretty, pretty standard pattern, again, it's, they're overlapping too, so it's not all the same in every single person, in most people it is, but they, they almost act like maps that way, you know? Does that, does that answer your question? That's a very good question. That's high, really high level, you know, by the way. So if you understand that concept, you've, you've gotten, You've done a really, really good job. And we talked about this already. So these type of, these biochemical changes, so what ends up happening is, remember I told you there were components within that disc that love water, they're hydrophilic, they soak up water. Over time, we lose that, unfortunately. So we lose those proteoglycans, the, the GAGs, we lose those. And then over time, then, then it, it turns these biochemical changes, turn into morphologic changes where we start seeing microscopic and macroscopic changes. Yeah, you literally start seeing that going from a nucleus, right, jelly, to the crab meat, to the beef jerky. That's real, that's, that's that morphologic change. And then that leads to what's called biomechanical changes. Because again, remember I told you, these discs act as like shock absorbers, right? So just imagine like when you're young, you want the discs to be hydrated like crazy because you want that shock absorption. Well, when you have a disc herniation, you have a hole in that disc, it hurts like crazy. So what you'll find is that people with disc herniations, remember we talked about when you lay down at night, it, it swells up, right? In a contained disc, that's totally, that's what exactly what you want. But when you have a disc that's right up against a nerve, right? In the morning, just imagine this, you're laying down at night, that disc swells up like crazy and it's right next to a nerve. And then you try to get up, and it presses down on it, and that, and that swollen disc is going to even put more pressure on that nerve. So people in the morning have a really hard time getting up in the morning, and that's the reason why, because of the, all of these sort of changes that occur over time. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So this guy, Nakamson, is a guy, he's a very well-known spine surgeon from Europe that did this study that I told you about. So he literally, they, they put in these pressure transducers in the disc, and this is what they found. See, like when, you, when you're just laying down, you know, when you're, when you're down around here laying down, it's like 25 kilograms of pressure. When you stand up here, it goes up to 100 four times compared to lying down. And when you sit down, surprisingly, it goes to around like 150, okay? And the worst is when you're sitting, bending forward and carrying a weight, that goes up to like 250, right? That's significant. So it literally goes up like 10x compared to when you're laying down. So I always tell my patients, don't ever pick up things like this. Always pick it up with your legs, like squat down. Pick it up close to your body like that. That's the way to do it. I mean, just for the rest, that's just a good rule of thumb to use. So sitting's really bad. That's all I can tell you. Sitting for a long period of time, every hour I would get up, stand, stretch. That's what I tell my patients also. So this is that picture I showed you previously, right? Look what happens over time. And that's just time. See, the, the discs get all dried out. And just this, this, here's the disc, nice healthy disc, dried out disc. And look, and look at the, this is where the spinal canal is, nice and wide and open. Look what happens at, see? That's what we call stenosis. You've heard about people getting like coronary artery disease that have heart attacks, right? So that's what ha ends up happening is they, they form plaques around the, the vessels that lead to the heart, right? And so the same thing can happen in the spine, but when it happens in the spine, you start developing symptoms that are more neurologic, and we call the stenosis. And so what ends up happening is people, like and I'm ta telling you, probably like our parents and our grandparents start developing, they start doing this over time. Because why? Remember I told you before, 
when you try to do this, the spinal canal gets tighter, right? So they have a t real tough time doing this because it makes the spinal canal smaller. So you have to you have to bend forward like this. It's not that they have a structural problem. They may, but oftentimes it's because they have stenosis. And then when you treat the stenosis, then they're able to stand straighter. They're, they're able to walk longer. And that, that's one of the very gratifying things that we do is we, when we just clean this out, do what's called a laminotomy. Some people do laminectomies or framenotomy, and then we open it up. They, they, it really helps their function significantly. So again, we talked about this, the degenerative cascade. This is a normal process, but essentially, it's like a flat tire, you know? Just think about anything that happens with your car, right? When you're driving your car, most of you drive, I'm assuming now, by now? Most of you, yeah. <laughs> but like, you, you'll find that all, you have to take your car in, typically it has to do with things that are moving or things that are draining, right? So you have to get an oil change because it runs dry. You have, to get, you have to put air in your tires because the air runs out. You have to get your brake pads replaced because the brake pads wear down. And that's because all these things that wear down over time, it's the same thing, moving parts in your body like the joints and the discs, similar thing happens. So over time, all these things break down, so you have to fix them. So this is a, a picture, side-by-side -side picture of what it looks like when you have a disc that's degenerated. See that between three and four on the x-ray and then on the MRI? So that's what happens when you have a disc that, that kind of just wears out, you know? And then this is what happens when you have a disc herniation. So when you have a disc herniation and it causes pressure on the, on the nerves, then that's when you start f showing symptoms. If it's in the lumbar spine, you're going to have them, they either have pain going down their legs or in their buttocks or like numbness or tingling in their feet. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more focus on the lateral anatomy here. So the, the, these are all just alphabet soup, but we're going to just follow just focus on lateral. These are all type of approaches that we do as spine surgeons. So LLIF is a lateral lumbar interbody fusion, but it's an approach. And this is becoming really um, popular in what we do. This is, this is how we set, set up in the OR. And this is a picture of, of me and my, one of my former fellows who's practicing in Dallas right now. But essentially, what we do is we put the patient on a side position. And then the reason why we put, put it on the side position is so that we can try to access it from the side. And this is a relatively newer type of procedure, especially minimally invasively. So we use a, uh, we use a fluoro or intraoperative x-ray to take a look at an, an AP and lateral view of the spine. That's called a pedicle. They look like little owl eyes, right? So that's where we put a lot of the instrumentation, a lot of the screws that we put in into the spine we put in through the pedicle, which is just through the bone. And then we target it. So what we do now is we do, when we do minimally invasive surgery, and that's what Dr. Wang and I do, we, do, we use tiny little incisions. Before, they would have to make this large incision all throughout the flank like this, you know? They used to call it a saber incision, just like if you were like fighting somebody with a saber, and you cut them and they make a big gash like that, that's the type of incisions we used to make. And that's the type of incisions some surgeons still make. But now we're able to do it with the tiny little incisions about the size of a quarter now. So we target it, and then we imagine the spine underneath, right, with, with x-rays or computer-assisted navigation. We target it like this, and then we get into these layers, and you'll get into the abdomen tomorrow. But you have to be careful here, because you can see that normally when we go from the back here, all we typically are worried about are muscles, typically, and, and nerves within the spinal canal. But when we go through the side, now we're talking about like kidneys and bowel, you know, we, we, we're, we have to think about other structures that we could potentially get into. So these, these are the layers. When we go into, we make it in small incision. So this is about, what, like three, three and a half centimeters. We, we start seeing muscle there. So this looks pretty different even from the cadavers, right? So this is what a real human dissection looks like. So you get into the external oblique, which goes in like this, a certain orientation. These are the different layers within your abdomen. Then you have the internal oblique that goes in the opposite direction. And then you have this muscle called the transversus abdominis that goes along the side like that. And then finally, you get into this, this little very shiny layer. And, and for those of you that were at, at um, my station for a little bit, I showed you the, um, the, the, the plural, right? Parietal pleura, remember that? that the really shiny 
thin. This is very similar in the abdomen. So this is the transversalis fascia. When you pop through it, then you see fat. And everybody has this. It's called retroperitoneal fat. When you're in here, then you know you're in this space called the retroperitoneum. And the peritoneum is just a fancy word for your gut. So everything that's in your belly, now we're behind the belly. And behind the belly, there's, there tends to be a lot of fat. So then we put our finger in there. We're like feeling it. We're feeling for a muscle called the psoas muscle. Okay. And just, does anybody like to eat steak? Who likes filet mignon? Okay, that's one of my favorite cuts. So f the filet mignon is the psoas muscle, okay? So the filet mignon, filet mignon is, is essentially is the psoas muscle that allows you to do this. It allows you to flex your, your hip up, okay? So that's your psoas muscle. And we go through the psoas muscle in order to actually get into the spine. So that lateral to the psoas muscle, you have this nerve. This is actually a sensory nerve called the genitofemoral nerve. And if you injure this nerve, you get numbness around your groin area. So when we first started doing these type of approaches, people would come with numbness in their groin area. We'd be like, ah, that's nothing, you know? But we didn't, rec we didn't recognize that we were actually injuring the genitofemoral nerve, you know? Um, and sometimes that can be permanent, and that's pretty annoying, right? Like numbness in your groin area. So this is a, if and when you get into medical school, this is one of the first type of nerve tests that you'll, you'll, you'll get this, like, ad nauseum. They'll, they'll test you in medical school, and if, especially if you go into spine surgery, you have to know the brachial plexus, which is essentially, it starts off in the cervical spine, then it, and it becomes a plexus, and then it becomes this peripheral nerves, okay? You don't need to memorize this. But what we're recently now learning more and becoming more familiar with is the lumbosacral plexus, and this is what we need to be cognizant of when we actually go in through the side to try to get into the spine, because we can't injure it, you know? Um, and so this right here, this muscle here, this is the this is a psoas muscle, the filet mignon, and then there are a lot of nerves around surrounding the nerve as well as in the muscle itself. So you have to be really careful when you go in there. We have to use what's called neuromonitoring. So there's a probe that determines whether or not there are nerves in that area when we do surgery. And so um, some of the, the tools that we use, we use microendoscopic um, uh, instruments. So just imagine before. You know how like in, in the lab, we, we open everything up so you can see the spine, right? Well now, with the advent of things like this and a microscope and an endoscope, we're now able to do the surgeries by putting this camera in the spine and then we're doing surgeries like this now, okay? So then you get pictures like this where you have a disc that's herniated out like that, that's a disc herniation. And then that's after the discectomy. And then you're able to do through like a one centimeter incision, you know? So these are like outpatient surgeries where before we had to do laminectomies, patients had to be admitted in the hospital overnight, and now we're able to do these outpatient, you know? Um, so this is a tube-based where we take a little tube and do the exact same type of procedure, and microendoscopic discectomy, and then we're able to do it through small incisions about the size of a dime, in this case, in the cervical spine. And then this is a case presentation of a patient with, I mentioned this word before, spondylolisthesis. Spondylo in Greek means spine, lysthesis means a slippage. If you can see over here, there's a slippage in between the fourth and the fifth vertebra. Like the rest of these line up great, and between the fourth and fifth, there's a step off here, you know? We call that a spondylolisthesis. So this is what it looked like before surgery, and then after surgery, or like this is intraoperatively, so this is what we do during surgery. So we're able to, use screws and rods to try to bring it back into normal alignment. And then we can also put in spacers in between the collapsed disc spaces to try to jack it up. In fact, now they have spacers that you can actually literally jack up like it's like a, when you're jacking up a car. It actually has that same type of effect. We're able to do it through tiny little incisions now. So it's gotten much more sophisticated than before. You know, So this is just a collage of the different types of incisions that, that we can use. So this is a, another patient. Uh, with scoliosis, so um, this is a patient with a kind of a degenerative scoliosis. You can see the curvature though there, right? So people with scoliosis, I think someone mentioned that they had scoliosis. This is pretty severe. When you get to the 45 to like 50, it becomes, it starts, we start thinking surgery, especially in the, in the adolescent population. So for these type of procedures, we're also able to use minimally invasive procedures to put in spacers and screws and rods to straighten that out, you know? 
so that we were able to do it through tiny little incisions now to try to reconstruct their spine. We're able to do it through, through small incisions like this. So the patients end up doing better. They have less pain. They're able to recover much quicker. So if you had to have surgery, which one would you choose, right? I can tell you right now, still, still even now, this open surgery still represents the majority of the way we still do spine surgery. Can you believe that? In today's day and age, we still do surgery that way. Question. Yep. Yeah, I think it's funny because endoscopic surgery, so where you literally use an endoscope, that's really popular in, in Europe and, and Asia, but it hasn't caught on here in the States. So I think that's definitely the next phase of development. And I do believe that we're going to be almost doing like really microscopic surgery with endoscopes with robotic assistance. I think that's definitely, I mean, like people think that really, really robots, but I'm just telling you right now, that's definitely where we're going. I, I do predict in the future, in the near future, I, th I think within the next 10 or 15 years, that um, surgeons like Dr. Wang and myself, we're going to be managing robots in, in the OR. I really do believe that. There's a question here. Um, so is it the surgeon who chooses like the top versus bottom surgery, or is it the patient? That's a great question. What, it, what should it be? It should be the patient, right? But this is the thing. So for some reason, spine was always sort of like 10 or 15 years behind general surgery. So the, it really started off with general surgery and then sports medicine surgery where they went, you know, like I did a ge general surgery internship. And even when we had to have like what's called an appendectomy, we have to take out someone's appendix. We did it through, it's kind of a mini open. And then now people do it through a laparoscope. They put in a scope and they just do it like this, right? With tiny little incisions like this. Same thing with like if you had knee surgery, like a torn meniscus or an ACL rupture, my, my uh, orthopedic spine or sports medicine colleagues do through tiny little incisions like this. They go like this, they do the entire procedure. And so that's where we're at right now with spine surgery. So, but what's happened is with all these kind of technologies and new techniques, typically you need to have like a, a group of surgeons like Dr. Wang and myself who are, who are really promoting these, these procedures because it's beneficial to the patient. I mean, everybody, you, you know, you guys aren't doctors, but you know that the bottom one, the patient has to do better than the top one, right? That's just, it makes a lot of sense, you know? But what ends up happening is like, even both of us trained doing the open surgery, but we had to teach ourselves how to do the minimally invasive. And what's happening is as we teach our fellows and our residents how to do these procedures, then it becomes a standard of care, you know? But that's a really good question. There's a question in there. It's funny because like even five or 10 years ago, people were like, eh, minimally invasive surgery, it's just a fad or whatever. And then now even people that don't do, that don't do, truly do minimally invasive surgery, everyone, it's a marketing thing now too, where the, the people that don't re aren't really, you know, truly minimally invasive surgeons, even on their websites, they'll say, I'm a minimally invasive spine surgeon. Because it's because the patients are becoming much more educated, right? And they're demanding it. So when they demand it, then, then the surgeons are like, ooh, I need to learn how to do this, or I need to retire. <laughs> Go ahead. So, um, yes. Very, very good pickup. And my apologies for using words that we take for granted. You know, these are all. This is a funny thing. It's just language, right? But in reality, a laminectomy. Ectomy means like you're going to take it and you're going to throw it out. That's essentially what it means. A laminotomy. Otomy means you're gonna make a little hole, okay? So meaning that what we do is instead of having to take out, I showed you guys on the, in the spine, there's a spinous process in the lamina. When you do a laminectomy, you take it out a lot and you throw it away, right? You saw that. That's, but that's very, there's a reason why those structures exist, right? There's a reason why those tendons and ligaments exist. It's form and function, right? So when we go in there, the surgeon's taking out all these structures that normally should be there, what do you think is gonna happen? It'll collapse over time, yeah. That's exactly what happens. When you do a laminectomy, that destabilizes those, and I showed you in, uh, in, at my station that supraspinous and interspinous ligaments, when you take that out, that can cause instability later on. Very good questions. Um, any other questions? So, in summary, um, you know, I think we're, we're on the verge of like really innovative things that are happening in spine. Spine surgery is really, really interesting in that, in, in that regard where 
you do have to, it's, you have to think about the procedure and it's, it's really, it, it really is like solving a crime, right? Like somebody comes into your office and you're trying to figure out exactly what they have. And you, and you, need, now don't, you need to figure out based on the history and the physical exam, what their diagnosis is. That's critical. Number one, what is their diagnosis? And then what is the treatment? And typically we'll always exhaust the conservative treatment options, including time and rest and physical therapy and medications and sometimes even injections. Those are like the five things that we always sort of promote. And if those things don't work, then surgery. And you saw that you know, about 20% of the people that, that have these type of conditions require surgery. And that's when they come to us, when they fail all those type of um, options.